I'm glad to be here and pretty impressed at 7.15 that everyone showed up. So it's uh, glad to be here for several reasons. Uh, Forty years ago when I worked for the Soybean Association, went down to Hudson, Iowa, where it was located at that time. I thought, wow, this is a great new job, until I realized we were staying with a farmer that was president at that time, not at a hotel. <laughs> so we didn't pass the hat, but we didn't spend much money. For several reasons, I'm glad to be here. When I left yesterday morning, left Minneapolis to drive down here, I went to the gym because I had to leave early, got up, went to the gym. Usually I, I grab a glass of water when I go. And when I left the gym, I forgot water. So it bugs me to pay 99 cents for a bottle of water. But I went to the Lund's grocery store. And as I was pulling up, I saw my friend George, who I'd been working out with, walking in ahead of me. And George had been pulling a bunch of pranks on me, and I didn't feel like it was even. So I pulled up as fast as I could behind him, slammed on the brakes, honked the horn, and it worked. We had five inches of snow, but he dove under a pickup truck. <laughs> he came up looking pretty mad. I rolled my window down, and I went, uh-oh. It wasn't George. <laughs> Some other big guy. And I'm usually pretty quick on my feet. He said, you think that's funny? I said, yeah, <laughs> that was the wrong answer. So I rolled my window up and I started going and I got glad to be here in one piece. So, a lot of information to go through in the next 45 minutes. I will welcome your questions. I'll give you my email, toll free number at the end. Call with questions. I've traded commodities for 40 years, farmed, been a commodity broker for 38 years. I've learned a lot of things that work. I've tried a lot of things that don't work. And I'm gonna go through market outlook, touch briefly on the complex farm program, and then kind of look at some of the data I put together specifically for this meeting in terms of the long-term outlook for agriculture. So again, as best I can, I will answer your questions as we go along. Thanks to the Soybean Association, 50 years of leadership, long-term approach that they've taken, demand and investing in tomorrow. China and biodiesel, two things that have really improved profits. Higher prices and more profits, and we're happy to try to feed a hungry world. And so that's been what I've seen since I first started in the industry. You should all have a Farmer's Almanac that I write each year, number eight, grab it. I had meetings uh, earlier this week, my friends at Successful Farming, I had great luck working with them the last several years. Uh, and so I, I really enjoyed this industry. I like it, and I think I'll be doing it 40 years from now. Our topics today, we're going to go through three reasons why prices went so low. If you had invited me in to speak a year ago, I would have said, be prepared and plan your marketing for low prices in the fall of 2014. It went lower than I thought. What caused the turnaround? Some ways you can improve your marketing as you look ahead. Uh, it's, it's always easy in my job to look at charts that go backwards. I'm going to try to also look ahead. Some of the key things you should do in the farm bill in a few final thoughts. Why did prices get as low as they did? That comes up. I just anticipated every conference that I speak at. Three real reasons. Huge global crops. That's the number one reason. Second would be we're at some very high historic price levels. And third, all of the long-term cycles I work with point lower. How big were the supplies? And this is something I went back 30 or 40 years at. Look at the crop production, how much we've ramped up corn production from 7 billion bushels 30 years ago to almost 14 billion. China has been ramping it up. Brazil has come from nowhere up to about 2 billion bushels. And to put this in perspective, Iowa and Illinois combined each produce more corn than Argentina and combined they produce more corn than Brazil. I don't care where you look in the world last year, we had big crops. Soybeans, similar story. When I worked for the Soybean Association, I remember the mantra at that time was, we need to grow a two billion bushel crop someday and we might export half of it. <laughs> we hit that target and then some. Close to four billion bushels in production this year. Look at that red line from China. Wow, they've come from virtually 300 million to almost 3 billion bushels. Brazil and Argentina combined produce more soybeans than the U.S. If we come back here five years from now, I think Brazil may be producing more beans than the U.S. alone. 
Our production has been fairly flat, but it's been trending higher. Again, whether you look at corn, soybeans, U.S., South America, we had big crops last year. Record yields in the U.S., 173, 174 bushels per acre. Illinois having a state average of nearly 200 bushels an acre. Corn yields were good. Bean yields, 47 and a half. Boy, it was a big deal when we broke through that 40 bushel national average. It's not going to be long. We'll hit 50. Big yields gives you big production. 14.4 billion bushels. 3.9 billion bushels of beans. Big crops in the world, big crops in the U.S., projections for huge ending stocks. That's one thing interesting in USDA. I've been there. I watch how they put the numbers together. So I'm not saying this to be critical, but one thing's been consistent. Ten out of the last ten years, they have underestimated demand and overestimated ending stocks. If I'd been here three months ago, that number way on your right would have been 480 million bushels ending stocks. That's when beans were nine bucks a bushel. Last month it was 450. Now it's 410. I'm betting it's gonna run up somewhere between 280 and 350 when we look at this number next year. Demand is through the roof. So we came off some high prices. When you have seven and eight dollar corn, you're more likely to go down than up. Two years ago, we had beans up to $18, cash prices over $17 for quite a while. $18, $15, $13, and eventually $9. And so this $904 low in beans on the nearby contract, I think, is a major long-term low. A lot of people don't agree with it. It may not be right, but I think it is. Long-term grain cycles were due in the fall of 2014. I was trained to be in ag economics. I studied supply demand statistics and projections for price. I had a retired executive from Cargill, took me under my wing, taught me about charting, basis, money management when you trade. 40 years ago, I worked for him for seven years. And in hindsight, it was the best thing that happened to me in my life. It was better than any MBA program I could have ever went through. There's a long-term cycle on so corn that averages 68 months. It's not perfect but it's pretty darn accurate. Look at that chart. Last major low came in December of 2008 during the financial crisis. Add on 68 months, when does it project? September of 2014. September 2014, we went to 318 on the nearby futures and we've never looked back. Grains are up again overnight. We're 94 cents over the low made on September 29th. And so to think that we're going to go down and take out that low, not impossible, but highly improbable. Soybeans, this isn't as reliable. It's not as perfect, but it is a pattern I look at. 39 months low to low. I had initially projected lows in March of 2015. I now think that the low October 2nd at 9.04 on nearby beans will prove to be a major low. I was surprised at how low corn got. I actually thought soybeans would go lower. The reason they didn't, I'll get to in a second. I'm racing through this. I guess I've had enough coffee. Questions along the way. I can't see real well, but the other thing I would encourage you to do, you've got a sheet of paper and pen in front of you. If you've got a question, write it down, and I'm sure somebody from the staff will help carry it forward. It says, I really sincerely believe the questions you bring with you are just as important as what I have to say. We've seen a huge turnaround. I've been surprised at how low we got, and to be honest, I didn't think we'd be up 94 cents in 12 weeks in corn. I didn't think we'd put $1.44 on beans from October 1 to the end of November. So it's been a big ride down and a big ride up. Again, everything you're gonna see me do today, we're gonna to talk about what's going on in the world what's going on in the US, and then any other patterns that I think are important for you to see. Global demand at a record. Thank you for the Soybean Association. I was with some of those initial trade teams when people came back in 1974 and 75, and in hindsight, that was just an amazing time, and checkoffs weren't always real popular back then. <laughs> A lot of people were saying, Cargill ought to do it. 
Cargill gets a benefit. No, we would have never had 15 bushel beans if it hadn't been for the investment. And I'm not saying that because I'm at the Iowa Soybean Association. I tell everybody at the conferences I speak all over the U.S. the same thing. And if they want to argue about it, I'll argue. <laughs> I know my numbers. This is global production of corn. 38 billion bushels of corn produced. We had some ending, some beginning stocks, mainly stashed in the strategic food reserve in China. 38 billion bushels produced. How much are we going to use? 37 billion. Isn't that amazing? What happens if we don't have another big crop again next year? We're going to chew our way through it. Ending stocks are large, but I don't view them as burdensome. Of all the ending stocks in the world, about 2 billion bushels are stuck in the U.S. Global soybeans. Again, I converted this from millions of metric tons to bushels. It's easier for me to understand. About 11.5 billion bushels of beans produced. We're going to use about 10.5 billion. One amazing stat I stumbled across a while ago, and probably people in the feed grade council are aware of this. We have a lot of hogs in the U.S., don't we? About 80, 82 million head of hogs. The increase in the Chinese hog herd the last five years is greater than the U.S. hog herd. Think about that. What do those hogs eat? <laughs> Corn and bean meal. And the projections are that there's going to be 200 million people move from rural poverty to the cities and get jobs in China. And what do they want to eat when their budget allows when they get a paycheck, they want pork. I think that we're going to see China do the corn market in the next decade, what they've done to the soybean market in the last decade. And so you're going to hear a lot of speakers this winter that are gloom and doom. I'm not one of them because of what we're seeing here. Second reason, we're seeing strong domestic demand. It's not just the world that's using more corn and soy. Again, I went back to when I worked for the Soybean Association 40 years ago. 5 billion bushel crop, cranked it up to 40 billion bushels. Feed and residual has stayed about flat. That's a little bit deceptive. Ethanol wasn't there 40 years ago, unless you went to Tennessee. 30 years ago, it isn't on the chart. 20 years ago, 1 billion bushels. This year, 4.8. One of the threats that we have to corn prices and corn profitability is if crude would go and stay below 50 bucks. I think there's a, a good chance, and I'm not bullish on it, that we put in a spike low in, in the energy markets on Tuesday. But look at that line from nowhere 30 years ago to that. I'm friendly to soybeans because of China. I'm friendly long term to corn because of China. And this ethanol, they may slow down, but it's not going to go away. And so you can see the, how much we're using in the U.S., and again, the ending stocks are large, but I think as you look ahead, we've went from 2.05 billion bushels to 2.010 billion bushels to 1.998. Every time the USDA comes out with supply demand report. And with harvested acreage, I'm suspecting the January 12, 2015 report is going to show numbers of crop production slightly smaller than we've seen before. They've never got the acreage right yet. And our northern harvest, right, our family farms in southwest Minnesota and the customers I talked to in northern Iowa, Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin were all pretty disappointed the further they got into the corn harvest. So I'm not saying the USDA is wrong because I think that the data changed since the last survey was taken. Soybean demand, wow, look at 40 years ago, 1974, when I was working for the Soybean Association for that first year out of college, we needed to someday grow 2 billion bushels. <laughs> we blew by that target. Nearly 4 billion. Uh, look at what our crushing is. Exports, again, thank you, China. We do have large ending stocks, but the trend month by month, report by report, is for lower numbers. And so great global demand, great U.S. demand. And the other thing that's really changed since 2005 is the Wall Street money that comes into the commodity markets. There was two professors at MIT in 19, 2005 wrote a paper saying a mixture of stocks, bonds, and commodities outperforms stocks and bonds alone 
and has less volatility year to year. It's like the holy grail. How can I make more money with less volatility? And we had people pile into commodities, unbelievable, what they've done. And so the, the flow of money, at the beginning of October, we had about 21,000 contracts longs by managed funds. They hit on 186,000 a week ago. And I think if I had updated the slide, they'd be about 156. That's a lot of contracts. On soy, they went from being long about 21,000 to 76,000. And they've been short wheat, 51,000 contracts two weeks ago. You probably don't follow the wheat market very much, but it's been painful <laughs> for them to be short over the last period of time. These funds buy on strength and sell on weakness. They're momentum traders. So they give you a lot higher highs than what you expect, a lot lower lows. If you ever look at this weekly commitment of traders report from the CFTC, and funds are long 280,000 contracts of corn, 21 or 22% of the open interest be ready to sell. That's not sustainable. Get commodity funds long, 180, 200,000 contracts of beans, 22% of the open interest, and they always get their hair cut, okay? So just some of, the, some of the metrics, another pattern, another factor we have to watch. This might be some news to you, but questions or comments on this, again, you have a question, write it down, pass it over. I'll sure do my best to answer them. After a long happy hour and a long night last night, questions are a little slow today, so. Five ways to improve your marketing in 2015. In August and September, I, I write for Successful Farming, I started getting calls from a lot of people that were not customers of mine, but they'd read the column, and usually between 2 and 4.30 in the afternoon, and they want to talk about the corn market. And I'm always polite with people, patient with people. And inevitably, it came down to they had all of their 2013 corn. And they were looking for a savior. <laughs> they were looking for help. And so I would usually ask them, what was your plan? And more than once, I told a farmer very politely that hope is not a marketing plan. Okay, so how do you do a better job in 2015? And if you want, if you, if you email me, go to the website, I'll email you a really good article. Create a marketing plan. We've got software that can help you. What's your cost of production? When do you need the money? What crop insurance level are you at? All of these things factor in. You can make a marketing plan that works. And for a lot of the lenders, a lot of the younger, more leveraged farmers, it's part of what they need to do to get an operating loan. Everyone should want to do it because it's your money. You're not growing corn and beans. You're growing money. How do you grow the most money you can? Uh, my dad came from Holland, started as a hired man, rented land, bought land, he worked really hard. And in his mind, if you weren't out in the barn or you weren't out in the field, you weren't working. <laughs> Some of you are nodding your head and you can relate to that. It's no longer true. <laughs> Spending time in the office, watching markets, keeping on top of a marketing plan, making sure your offers are in, that's all part of your farm business. If you don't enjoy doing it, if you don't like doing it, find somebody in your farm who does. Son, daughter, daughter-in-law, somebody needs to stay on top of it. Make incremental sales. I'll show you my track record here in a little bit. And you're going to see a bunch of red arrows. 10, 20% sales. There's no one big sale at the top, but I do have a lot of happy customers. Use price targets. If I'm selling grain, March corn hits 428 today while I'm speaking, it's going to get sold because that offer's there. I had three customers who sold December 2012 corn futures at 850 a bushel. All three had resting offers in and it got filled at 2.20 a.m. during the night markets, and it never looked back, because it opened lower at 8.30 that day, and it never went back to 8.50 again. The only reason they got that offer off was because they had resting offers in there. And so that, you know, you, you, it's good to watch the market, it's good to stay informed, but more importantly, if you know what price you're willing to sell at, call that offer in to the elevator you're working with, the broker you're working with, let them do his job. Use time targets as well as price targets. Old, old rule. You might have heard it many times, but it works. When you're planting corn, you should be selling corn, cash and new crop. 
That's a rule that's worked 24 out of 30 years. If you're a numbers guy, that's a number you like, right? It didn't work in 2011 and 12. I realize that. People who did nothing those two years came out on top, but that's not going to work again probably for the next decade. When I see a marketing rule that works 24 out of 30 years, I keep doing it. Use a variety of marketing alternatives. When I had farmers call in, they were really frustrated. I asked them how they sold their crop, and they usually told me they only sold cash and they only sold it was in the bin. There's hedges, hedge to arrive contracts, options contracts, basis contracts. If you're not using all of the different tools that are there, it's really difficult to do a good job. So if you want to improve your marketing next year, if, you, if I'll show you my email address later on, or if you grab one of these Farmer's Almanacs, my uh, website's right there. It's there, five ways to improve your marketing in 2015. How did it work last year? If we'd been here in early December, that's what the corn chart looked like. That's what the bean chart looked like. That's where we made sales. We fortunately had one 20% sale on this is in September of 2013, you don't see in there. So we came in the corn harvest, half the corn sold ahead, and we're now pushing most of the people up to 70 or 80% sold. Soybeans, uh, we had 20% sold September of 13, 30, 50, about 70% sold ahead prior to harvest. Very good average price. You don't see one big 100% arrow up there, do you? <laughs> it's too nerve wracking and get a good average price by doing that. Our current target for selling more beans is at 11.04 on the March contract. And again, we have a 10% offer in there. We did two things this week. We sold wheat yesterday and we bought spring fuel on Wednesday. How will it work this year? We've had a nice bounce off the bottom on corn, a nice rally off the bottom in soybeans. We have offers in at 440, 480, and 520 on December 15 corn. Chance of going to 520, I want to be very honest, is less than 1 in 10. But if it gets there, <laughs> we will sell. 460 to 480 through hedges and puts, we're going to have a lot of the crop sold. Is that possible? Early indications to me are 3 to 5 million acres less corn next year and the possibility of a very challenging spring trying to get the crop planted on time. So those two factors, if it plays out, could give us a pretty good selling opportunity this spring or early summer. Soybeans, we missed our first target up at 1060 by about a nickel. I'm very confident it'll get down somewhere around 1080 to 1120. We're going to get a lot of the crop hedged or covered with put options. The fact that farmers harvested a huge crop in 2014 and they're not selling any of it Short term has been very bullish to basis and futures. Long term, it sets up a potential shipwreck. Don't overstay a weather rally. Questions, comments on this? I'm curious, how many of you have been uh, to meetings on the new farm bill? Okay, good, well, over half, excellent. It, it's complex. I have a degree in ag economics. I've studied farm bills and markets for 40 years. And this is initially was about as complex as anything I've ever seen. Uh, a lot of decisions to make. Should I change my base acres? Should I update my yields for each crop? If there's 100 farmers in here today, 98% per, of you should do it. That's not a difficult decision when I'm in the Corn Belt. When I get further out west where there's milo and wheat, it's a more complex decision. It's not as easy to recommend. but. Uh, I'd be very surprised if uh, any of you, after you studied this, did not choose to update your yields and base acres. The real big decision is which farm program to go into. You've got a choice between price loss coverage, PLC, or ag risk coverage. And if you go ag risk coverage, then it's the county option or the individual option. You need to look ahead five years, because it's a very serious five-year decision. And I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone five years from now. You have to look all the way through 2018, and that's a binding decision. You change the renter on your farm, 
the decision stays. You change the ownership of the farm, the decision stays. So it's, it's a locked in five year decision. So how do you look out that far? Crystal ball doesn't work, doesn't go out that far. I look at the actual CBOT futures price going out through 2018. And then we did a, like 50 different Monte Carlo simulations. Important number on corn to look at is 370 a bushel MYA marketing year average. And if you looked at central Iowa corn prices, that would be pretty close to what the average corn price is. It's probably about 20 cents below the futures market. And I was driving down the other day, I saw a lot of bids posted around 380 to 386. So the current price of corn is high enough that you're not gonna get a PLC payment on your 2014 crop unless it goes significantly lower later this year. So that you look at the PLC program. So for 2014, I think you'll get a pretty decent payment on ARC County. If you think you're gonna get a PLC payment on your 2014 crop, the real smart thing to do would be to sell it before you get there. <laughs> different farm policies and different farmers have different marketing approaches. My approach has been the way I was brought up. You grow the crop, you turn it into cash and hope you never get a government check. Okay, those three things. To store your corn and watch the market go down and then think you won because you got a government check is ludicrous in my mind. But some people like to market that way. I don't see it that way. So for 2014, pretty good payments on ARC County, likely no payments on ARC on the PLC program. We can look at futures prices all the way through 2018. When you go Nov 2018 beans, December 2018 corn, it's not real liquid. <laughs> they haven't traded very long. Warning, don't put market orders in, okay? So what's it look like for 2015? We're about 434 a bushel. So the market there would need to drop 60 or 70 cents a bushel before you qualify before you would get any PLC payments. 2016, about the same, 430 a bushel. 2017, 427 a bushel. 2018, that little dot there was Monday, the first day it traded. I was very curious where that would start to trade. The initial trade was at 427. So this is something that I watch and something I'm looking at. So what do I think corn prices are going to do the next five years? I don't really have to think. I can look. What is the Chicago Board of Trade doing? it? And there's a lot of people that if they feel the market is overvalued or undervalued a penny, they'll jump all over it. So this is the, your best barometer of where prices are going to be over the next five years. And if you're super negative, and I'm, I'm certainly not, having some 420 and 430 corn sold all the way out through there, could be the right decision. If you own your land and um, you wanted to do some out there for a while and you believe some of the things that are you know, being forecast are going to 280 corn, do it in a small amount of your bushels. It makes more sense than going to the PLC program. This is very important. This is a five-year decision. I'm hoping I get some questions, comments, any thoughts. Raise your hand, please. You have a question? Yes. You. They've got mics in back. Jot down a question, carry it over. Okay. The question that I have here says, are HTAs a better alternative for 2015 soy or a 60 cent basis? Okay, where, uh, where's the farmer from? What county? Uh, sure it's okay, in Iowa it's a pretty easy decision. Yeah. Uh, the, six, uh, the HTA would be a better decision. Um, think you're going to do a lot better on basis. Look what happened this year. Uh, both corn and soybean basis from October till now, you've picked up a minimum 30 cents. Uh, corn bends this year from the October basis to the June basis will make you 60 cents a bushel. And I think that's true going forward. So uh, I, 
If you don't have storage and you have to sell off the combine, I'd probably have some offers at 40 or 50 under just to see if they want to buy it. But 60 under basis in Iowa is, is a pretty good reason to use hedges or hedge to arrive contracts. Good question. Okay, let's keep going then. Let's look at it on soybeans. Okay, so looking at the soybean market, your marketing year average needs to drop below 840 a bushel before you're gonna qualify for a PLC pro payment. Most of you in the room today have cash bids of 990 to 1020 a bushel. So if you're really concerned about prices going lower and think you might get a PLC payment, it's much easier just to sell the beans, right? Take the cash. And so the chance of getting that PLC payment on your 2014 crop which would be paid in October of 2015, is somewhere between slim and none. What about if we go out to 2015 beans? Got hit pretty hard the last couple of days. They're up about eight cents overnight. You're looking out there at around 10.15 to 10.20. A dollar 80 over where you would qualify for the payment. No 16, again, about 10, 10 a bushel. No 17 around 10, 12 a bushel today. Nov 18, see all those little dots out there? Very illiquid market, but it is trading. You can put it in with a limit order, and the prices out there are trading around 9.98 a bushel this morning. The bid and the offer, it's not really trading. So that is, again, $1.50 over where prices would need to drop to before you got a PLC payment. So that's when, when I'm looking at corn and soybeans, the productivity of the land you have here, the high established yields you have here, this is not a difficult decision. The policy is complex. It had to be that way to get it approved. But it, it is, a, when you break it down step by step, what are the decisions you need to make in this part of the Corn Belt, it's not a difficult decision. Bottom line and future grain prices. Almost all the USDA and such CBO, Congressional Budget Office, project five years of lower prices. I'm not sure I agree. Lows were due this fall or first quarter of 2015. After that, prices go higher. And odds are very good that your first two years of payments on your 2014 and 15 crop will be the largest payments you get over the next five years. Okay, what about if I ran a Monte Carlo simulation? I teach with a guy at the, my own trading academy that's PhD in math. So we plugged in all the numbers and it was kind of fascinating watching it. Was 90% of the time ARC County is the right scenario. 10% chance that the real negative forecast could be right and you'll kick yourself. Uh, we did this in early September. <laughs> And since then, I would guess that it probably went to 95% and 5% because of the rally we've had in all the contracts. Soybeans, more 80-20. I, I think a uh, chance of getting a PLC program in the next five years on soybeans is very, very remote. Uh, wheat has a little different story. Bottom line, which pro program to pay you for? Prices won't drop enough to where PLC triggers for corn or beans. ARC County for corn and beans is usually the best, less sure for wheat. What does this mean for farmers? Now again, ARC County, very easy choice, corn and beans. ARC IC does work for customers I have in North and South Dakota, Eastern Colorado, and the Delta. And that's because their APH is so much higher than their county average. I have customers in North Dakota that have a five-year APH of 170 bushel and their county average is 108. So ARC, IC works for those. If, if you look at what your county average is, and just knowing some of the customers and where some of you are from, I'm guessing most of your five-year Olympic average on yield is around 170 to 175. You have to have farms that have 20% higher APH than the county yield before ARC, IC might make sense. 
and it gets a lot more complex. ARC County, uh, you look at the five-year Olympic average, and because of that, it looks like we're going to have a pretty high lock-in for the next two years on both corn and beans. And so the payment range, I'm guessing, uh, around 70 bucks an acre, and you get paid, circle that number or write it down, ARC County, you're paid on 85% of your base acres. 85% being the key number on that whole slide. Do the math, county yield of 160, county price for 2014 crop and 2015 crop, very likely to be 531 a bushel. And so you look at your guarantee and take 14% off. We've got some, some good websites to do this. My bottom line is that the last two lines on that slide, you can do all the math. Current estimate is anywhere from $50 to $70 per acre ARC payment, county level, on corn, and $20 to $30 per acre for 14 and 15 on soybeans. What could prove that wrong? If prices went a lot higher, I'll have to eat those words. God, that would be terrible. <laughs> if prices go a lot lower, especially on soybeans, you could. But what we saw in September and October was fascinating to me. When we got bean futures below 950 a bushel, basis improved. They took the carrying charge out of the market, and especially the soybean meal market just inverted, showing good demand, very good nearby demand. Yes, sir. Well, uh, the meeting I listened to last summer is regarding base acres. In a meeting I attended last summer is in regard to base acres, and looking at this reinstates the question I have. Some of us have extremely high corn bases but maybe traditionally in the last few years we've been more of a 50-50 corn soybean situation. At that time the recommendation was just to retain as high a corn base as we could. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that statement? Yes sir, I would, yeah. No, the, the corn is where I think the, my numbers show you're gonna make the most money. And so uh, what was your yield back then? Was it decent in that period, close to where we are now? You'd update the yields, but you leave your base. That's the right decision in your case. So I said 90% of the people should do it. The other thing I've ran into is people that go all corn, all beans, all corn, all beans. And unfortunately, in that five-year period, three of the five years, they grew all soybeans. And so they're better off then to go with their old base, which was a higher base. Yes, sir. Al, um, I'm getting confused. <laughs> well, that's, I don't know if that's good or bad. Two days ago, I was sat in a room with a crowd twice as big at a county meeting put on by Iowa State University Extension on the Farm Bill. Their analysis was that Central Iowa farmers should choose to go PLC on his corn and ARC-CO on, on beans. You come along and you've given me some reason to give it some more thought. How much more fine-tuning by all of the experts is there going to be before we have to sign that bottom line that might impact our final decision. In other words, is it better to maybe slow down and sit and study and think before you go into that office? Mm -hmm. And then I, this deal where you've got to convince both the landowner and the tenant to go along on the same boat should be interesting too. Yeah, there are a lot of questions there. Um, what, I think one of the questions just to restate is, what could make me change my mind before March 31? All right. If corn drops 70 cents a bushel and beans drop a buck and a half between now and the end of March, I would consider enrolling some of it into PLC. If prices stay at this level or within 10% of this level, it is, I cannot imagine why anyone in the world would recommend PLC for a central Iowa farmer. And uh, you'd, you'd have to ask the other guy why he made that recommendation. I stand by these numbers. <laughs> And uh, I've made a lot of money trading through the years, trading against experts, okay? <laughs>
So I don't mean to be a smart aleck when I say that, but I mean, these numbers are what they are. As far as trying to get the, the landowner and the tenant to do it, uh, man, margins are thin right now. If you don't want to cooperate and sign up the paperwork, do you want to give up 60 bucks an acre on corn for the next year, 30 bucks an acre on soybeans for the next year? Meet, agree on it, talk it through, and see what's the best thing to do. Uh, your comment about you had a high corn base during those, those years and then 50-50 after. Okay, that makes it easy. If you had somebody farming the land or a new farmer come on two years ago, you have to cooperate, work together. And so that's the, the long term for the farmer and for the landowner. Uh, it's not like I'm going to win and you're going to lose. You're both going to win or you're both going to lose. So it doesn't have to be any animosity. There shouldn't be. I, I appreciate your questions. And, how straightforward that is, because there, to me, if you want, I'll get you a copy of this. If you want, I'll sit out here next year, and we'll see who's right. <laughs> I, I'm just glad I don't have to explain it to the absentee little old landlady, landlady lady in Los Angeles. Yeah. Because she didn't have to sign a paper, and, oh, it's going to be just mind-boggling. Yeah, I, I taught some, uh, webinars for the Corn and Soybean Association of Minnesota, and I taught it with an extension friend of mine. And uh, he got called up from some little retired lady in Duluth who really ripped into him. <laughs> so being the gentleman he was, he gave her Al Franken's phone number. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, we won't go there. <laughs> Did you hear the news this morning? Uh, first of all, Cuba opened up, so I got uh, three emails this morning from Amazon about traffic deals to Cuba, but then everybody's in an uproar because they banned all the nativity sets in Washington, D.C. None in, private, in public areas, none in private schools, none even in churches. Yeah, they said they couldn't find three wise men or a virgin. All right. All right, no more policy talk, right? Other questions, comments? Okay. I have one more someone handed me. What's the difference between a central Iowa farmer and a farmer from the corners as far as farm bill goes? Okay, from uh, the very good question, uh, I was out in eastern Colorado a few uh, weeks ago, and out there, they really just started growing corn the last five years. Before that, they grew corn, but it was mainly for silage, and so they had very low production versus what they actually have been growing the last five years. So the further you get into the fringe areas, North and South Dakota, where they started growing a lot of corn in the last five years, the Delta, they don't have the production history, and the people that were growing there quite often were growing it more for livestock feed, and so their, their established yields back from 2008 through 2000, uh, the previous countercyclical payment period are much, much lower, and so uh, that's one of the things. We've also had people have brought land out of CRP in large quantities in Dakota, eastern Colorado, Texas. Uh, that makes it a lot more difficult to go with the ARC county. Good question. Milo, uh, uh, very good Milo, potential for Milo uh, payments under PLC, and so if I'm into Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, uh, the Milo uh, might be a better choice to go PLC than ARC County. Good, good questions. Okay, need to keep rolling. Uh, payment rates, uh, big line up there. I'm sure you can't see it that hard. Uh, what we're looking at is where prices need to go for different payment levels. And under the ARC County, you can see where if corn goes to $3 a bushel, you get $77 an acre, $3.50 a bushel, 77, 390 a bushel, $69, and at 425 you get $15. And if corn were to average over 450, marketing year average, I'm optimistic, but not that optimistic, you'd get nothing. So just look at like uh, 390 a bushel, you get $69 an acre in ARC payment. On the soybeans, if you have a marketing year average of 965, you're going to get $30 an acre in payment. If you have a marketing year average of 1050, you don't get any. If you go all the way down to nine dollars for an entire year, you get $57. And so I'm going to relate back to the question on the recommendation which program to go into, ARC County or ARC. 
you get paid on 85% in the county level versus 65% on your ARC individual. Reference prices on the PLC, marketing year average, 370 on corn, 840 on beans. These are all of the numbers. You can go to the website. You are eligible if you go PLC for the supplemental crop insurance option. I don't think that's going to be worthwhile to do. And if you do see the prices go to about nine sixty to nine dollars on beans, you get zero on PLC. If you get a marketing year average on corn that goes to three fifty for the entire year, you're going to get about twenty eight dollars. So again, my thought is going with the PLC program for both 2014 crop and 2015 crop, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. And so these are some of my final thoughts. To not make a decision is a bad decision. Work with the landowners. Um, the farmers usually pays to update their base acres and yield, not all cases, base acres. If you were all corn for a few years during that period, you're gonna to wanna to take a look at it. Uh, this can and will drive values. Update yields. Most of you should update base. Choose ARC County over ARC Inc. What's the long-term outlook? Again, a lot of pessimism. And I put this together, uh, good research for the, the meeting today. Supply and demand of the product, the flow of money into the commodities, interest rates, US dollar, the number one driver of profitability for you is revenue. This is the corn revenue, total corn revenue going back to 1866. It took a long time to get up to $20 billion. How many of you farmed in 1980? Okay, quite a few. 1980 to 86 was not pleasant, was it? That chart shows you why. Revenue went from 20 billion to about 12 billion, and there wasn't enough money to pay the bills. You can also see it's been a real fun ride since about 2005, hasn't it? Up, up, and away. It's up, the trend is up, but it's cyclical. This is the bar chart, and you can see in 2005, we we're still collecting LDP payments. 2005. 2009 was a down year. 2014 is a down year. What is the trend on that chart? Yeah, we could be through a couple of challenging years in here, but this trend for our corn and soybeans is higher. Soybeans, again, when I worked for them in 1974, we broke above five billion. 1980 hit 14 billion, painful pullback into 86. <laughs> then from about 1999 on, thank you China, look at what that chart has done. This has been a pretty good run. 2005 was a tough year for profits. 2014 is a pullback. You don't have to be a real good chartist to look at that chart and see which way the trend is. And a lot of this is because the work that people in the Soybean Association did 20 and 30 years ago. Thank you to the founders. This is a, this is a good, good thing that they did for farmers and for the rest of the world. Margins are tight for next year. I don't want to be unrealistic, optimistic. But I think we are going to have the opportunity to sell at a profit. Uh, some of the people are thinking about cutting back on corn and going all beans. I, I think that could really backfire on you. Stay with your normal rotation. Do whatever you can to maximize your production. Take time and work on your marketing. And if you can get through 15 and 16, by that time, the long-term grain cycles, all the projections I work with turn higher. We bring a lot of seminars to farm yards. We do webinars at least three times a month. And we've got one tonight back in Minneapolis. Monday, January 12th, we'll have it at the, uh, over the internet on the crop report day. Second Tuesday of every month, we always do webinars. And so if you like this type of program and say, boy, I'd like to go to my office and watch this, you can do that very easily. We do archive all of these at the website. Any of you feel like that? <laughs> Doesn't have to be that way. You can get off the grain roller coaster. 
you can learn to make better decisions. You can control your destiny, your profits. Markets don't have to create anxiety if you work at it and create a plan. I couldn't resist saying thank you to the Iowa Soybean Association and at this time of year, soy to the world, okay? <laughs> These grain piles that uh, the uh, grain merchandisers have <clears throat> are not full. And they have been in the past. Uh, we've noticed that the uh, alcohol industry has chewed up a lot of corn during harvest. Uh, they're still uh, harvesting, progressing in, in Minnesota and places. Um, kind of really wondering what about this uh, uh, posted yield that our uh, illustrious government has put out. I, I, I just, I don't understand it. Uh, I can't see it. Okay, I, I work with farmers in 22 states, and I have a lot of people in Missouri that have 120 bushel APH that harvested 200 bushel corn. Uh, a lot of customers in north of Peoria that had farms that averaged 300 bushels. Okay, it may not, it definitely isn't where I grew up in Minnesota. We had hail, late planting, but it's a big area we grow corn in. USDA very thorough in the way they do things. The guys working there don't trade, they're scientists, they're mathematicians, and by God, their track record long-term is good. So you can disagree with them, and I have, but it's been expensive, okay? <laughs> I don't mean to be a smart aleck, but I mean, USDA does a darn good job, and if you trade against what they're telling you, you're usually gonna be wrong. On the production side, they've underestimated, dem under underestimated demand, They've, they initially, when ethanol first took off, they had a terrible time with getting how much was going for feed and how much DDGs was displacing. So there's a few years there where the grain stocks report were not perfect, but year in and year out, USDA numbers are very, very good. Yeah, well, my, uh, my best friend has a 860 acres uh, six miles south of the Iowa border in Missouri. His corn yield wasn't good and the basis was 80 cents. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting looking through a wide area. I got about one minute to go. Uh, please fill out the registration slips. Grab a farmer's almanac on your way out. I, uh, I sincerely enjoy being here. And uh, if I have time, maybe for one more question, Grant? Yeah, All right. Yes, sir. Okay, good question. If we go into a period of overproduction, you know, stagnant prices, what is, what's gonna happen in, in South America and Ukraine and Russia? Uh, they're gonna really slow down uh, their, their advances. In both of those countries, the increasing amount of land and production being brought in is not with debt or borrowed money. It takes cash flow, it takes profits to plow back in to bring new land into cultivation in South America. And right now, we're not making any much money and they're not making any money. I have customers in Ukraine and um, it is uh, a mess there. And uh, they're not gonna have enough money to buy fertilizer and seed corn next year. So their seed production, their corn production is gonna be way down. So this challenging prices is harder on South America and Eastern Europe than it is here. Do, uh, One more question, I, I don't wanna. Nitrogen, nitrogen seems to be quite a bit higher last, than it was last year. What's your thoughts on that? Why is that happening? Uh, my thoughts on fertilizer is that I'm probably as confused as you are. <laughs> okay. It seems like it should be lower. I chart and watch natural gas prices, what, what makes it. Uh, it's frustrating. We're in a global market. Uh, in, and so it's, uh, I recommended buying half of it earlier this year simply because the logistics, you can't have all the customers wait till the spring and then hope it's available. Uh, with looking at what's happened in natural grass and crude oil prices in the last few months, I'm hard time reconciling my mind why fertilizer prices are as high as they are. So I don't have any really good answer for you other than you know, kind of be patient and unless a lot of these things turn around that uh, price does work and I think within a couple of years, that corn to fertilizer relationship will get back closer to normal. I think there's been one more waiting a while, so 
let's give that question and then that is it. And then if you have other questions, you'll have to ask Al uh, at the break. I would like you to comment about interest rates. They've been incredibly cheap for a long time. And the influence that's going to have on the grain markets someday, I've been wrong for a long time, but someday they will increase. Okay. I've been amazed to think that five years ago we're going to have nearby prime at one. Home mortgages available at three and a half, four percent. You're not the only one that's been surprised and wrong <laughs> in the bond market and in the real estate mortgages. Longer term, what happens if the U.S. is doing really good in our economy? If we start upticking rates, it's going to be very bullish to the dollar. I lived through the 80s. The dollar in 1984 was 164 percent, and it destroyed our exports. It destroyed farm profitability. I don't see it getting that bad, but the current trend is people are putting money in the world in free market democracies, US, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. And that trend's gonna continue. And if that does, we're gonna look at stronger currencies, and that's gonna really cap our exports and our profitability, not necessarily in 14, but down the road. If we start gaining the US dollar index was at 89 yesterday, if that starts getting up to 102 to 110, it's a big, orange caution sign for you. So interest rates will eventually turn higher. It's a matter of when. But when they do, if the rest of the world stays low in their rates, it is not a good situation for land value or farm profitability.